Okay, welcome back everyone to our career development episode. So as the last part of our interview masterclass, we here have Landon to cover the tips and advice that will help you to evaluate and invest the opportunities and most essentially converting your dream opportunities at the end of the interview. So Landon, could you walk us through the conclusion of the interview? What are the typical steps and questions that we can get asked or we can anticipate to ask? Yeah, so it's great to finish the interview on a really with a really good impression. And you can do that by the way that you handle this last part where they ask you if you have any questions. The best way to start that is just to start is to, to say, um, sure, I just have a couple of quick questions. So that shows straight away that you're mindful of their time. You're not going to bring out 10 different questions which each require a long answer. You just want to get through a few quick questions uh, and then ask them one at a time and wait for the answer after each one. Don't just ask all your questions at once because that's very difficult for anyone to manage. So there are certain questions which you should not ask. And they certainly are think about things what, you know, like uh, what, what perks come with the job? Uh, it's like, do you have a gym? Um, you know, how, what, what sort of holidays? Uh, don't ask anything. Also, that's already been explained in the job ad or in the position description. It just shows that you haven't prepared for that interview properly. So again, make sure that you have really thoroughly prepared for the interview by looking at their website, looking at the job ad, so you're not going to be asking about something that you should know. Um, the other thing that you have to be careful with when asking questions at the end is not to ask something that they've already explained to you. So often at the beginning of an interview, the panel will talk to you a bit about the role and say, look, okay, the, the key features of this role, you'll be actually, the, the person in this role will be working with Maria here. Um, and the, the, the project that I'll be working on on the, the first three months uh, is a construction site um, in Bendigo, for example, right? So if you, at the end of the interview, turn around and say, oh, um, so who would I be working with in this role? and that's something they've already explained to you, your name's just instantly being crossed off. It didn't matter how good the rest of the interview was really, because it shows you're not someone who's paying attention, you're not a good listener. So there are definitely questions we want to avoid. The questions which are good to ask at the end of an interview relate to the role itself, and they sound like you are preparing yourself for the role. So there might be questions about the team you'll be working with, Who's in the team? Who will you be reporting to? Uh, who will you be managing in that role if it's more of a you know, senior role? Um, it might be to do with the particular projects that you'll be working on. Again, if they haven't already told you that uh, as part of the interview. So, um, oh, you know, which are the actual projects which are listed on your website? Uh, which of those will I be working on? Um, preparing yourself in terms of particular skills or software. You might say, look, is there a particular software that you're using uh, in, this, in your company or on this project that I can brush up on uh, to prepare for the role? So you're all the time showing that you are the type of person who likes to be prepared, who likes to, who wants to know more about exactly what you'll be getting yourself in for, so that on day one, you're already starting off on the right foot and you can sort of hit the ground running, as they say. So that should be the real focus of your questions. Uh, you can also ask questions like, um, what do you think are the main challenges of this role? So you are wanting to get your head again around what might be uh, particularly challenging or difficult for someone in this role. Again, that you're preparing yourself for it. So they're the main focus of your questions. You should not be asking about salary or benefits or anything else at this stage. You're just trying to show that you're the right person for the role. Yeah, thanks, Landon. Um, is there a set of questions that we shouldn't ask because they tend to be bounced back? For example, what we anticipate as the challenges. Could it be where the recruiters potentially bounce the question back to you and test your understanding and your prior research? Could it happen? Uh, so then in other words, they say to you, well, what do you think the challenges are going to be? Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, look, absolutely. And I think um, if you can answer, if you can pull off a good answer to that question by showing that you have thought through the role, 
that you have done some research, um, that you've done, you're, you're, you're bringing in your prior knowledge and understanding about the types of projects that they're working on, um, then there's going to be a really, you're going to be a really impressive candidate. For example, if you uh, you did a similar project where there were um, particular challenges with working with a type of concrete that they're using or something like that, um, you can you can say, well, I'm aware that some of the materials they take particular handling, or there can be um, procurement difficulties uh, or that sort of thing. If you are bringing in that sort of awareness, that's sort of going to really make you stand out as a candidate. So yes, but uh, they can be tricky to answer. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for answering that question. Um, so, as part of vetting the opportunity, um, one important aspect I always see recurring as a key theme is the corporate culture. So, before I ask the question, um, could, do you mind unpacking this term? How is it defined, and what, in your view, makes it quite important in evaluating an opportunity? Uh, the corporate culture. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what they're looking for is people who are going to be a good cultural fit. And that's the other term that's used around um, the idea of a work culture. So that's someone who understands the workplace conventions and is familiar with that environment so that when they come into the role, they are going to automatically know how to relate to other people in the role they're going to know the sorts of communication uh, conventions that are used and they can fit in fairly seamlessly. Now, if you are a recent graduate, that's much harder to manage, obviously, because you may not have so much experience. That's where doing something like an internship can be invaluable because it can give you that exposure and understanding of different workplace environments. Um, if you've come from overseas, one of the very crucial things to understand is that the Australian workplace culture or the Australian corporate culture may be very different from the sort of workplace culture that you're used to in a different country. And you're very advised to do some research on that. There are some obvious differences which jump out right away, such as the level of formality with which we address people, uh, the sorts of closer relationships and friendly relationships which are more typical in the Australian workplace than in many uh, countries overseas. Um, and there are a whole lot of other expectations around how people are, their attitudes towards holidays, whether they have a favourite football team sometimes can make that sort of difference as well. Uh, so all those sorts of um, expectations or understandings which are more around the culture uh, can be very difficult for some people to negotiate. The, the most damaging one that I've, in my experience really, is when someone who's applying, who doesn't have much Australian experience, uses too much deference or treats someone with too much respect, right? Or they say they use friends like Mr. or I'm so grateful for this opportunity which may be appropriate in, in another culture, but when it's used in an Australian workplace, what it says to the recruiter or to the hiring manager straight away is that this is someone who doesn't really understand the Australian workplace and therefore they're less likely to want to employ you. So you've got to have, be aware of that. I would suggest there's quite a lot of information online. You can Google this and, and find any, uh, any number of websites which talk about the Australian workplace. Um, spending as much time as you can around Australians, having conversations with them, asking about their work, asking what it's like at their workplace, getting volunteering experience, internship experience. All of these are going to help someone who has limited local experience bridge this gap between themselves and the, the corporate culture or the Australian workplace culture that they're trying to get into. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, although it might sound cliche, but arguably there's no probably better strategy than just preparing by all means. And I do understand that the interview certainly doesn't provide the avenue for us to start from scratch and thereby showing our incompetency and the negligence as well in some extreme cases. So uh, if we were to, if had the chance to really examine such aspects of uh, corporate culture, 
What do you think are the, some of the most important considerations that we need to account for to determine whether this is the right opportunity or the opposite? In order to play the long-term game and have a long-lasting work relationship. Sure. So this is a, the answer to this one may depend a little bit on where you are in your career. If you are a recent graduate, I would be much less concerned with whether that company is going to give me long-term prospects. Your main focus is just to try to get a role, really any role, because that's your first stepping stone in your career. You may only be with that company for six months. You may be with them for a year. It's, it's quite likely you'll actually be applying for other roles as you develop your career. Um, what you're looking for in your first role is just that foot in the door, as you mentioned uh, in an earlier podcast, I think. It's just getting that, getting that start. Once you have started and you have your first job in the industry, it suddenly makes getting your next job 10 or 100 times easier because you have some current local experience. Until you've got that, you are really having to work 10 times harder to try to get in the next job. So particularly early on, I would be much less worried about, is this my, a long-term prospect for me? Is this a company I'm going to be with for the next 20 years? Just get your next role. If you're someone with existing experience uh, from overseas and you haven't got much Australian experience, in one sense, you are in the same boat as someone who's just graduated. You don't have local experience, which is what employers are looking for. Too many employers, unfortunately, are just prepared to discount overseas experience. They might just say with different country, different standards. They may do things really badly over there for all I know. They, you know, they may be quite different. That doesn't translate to my, my company, my, their expectations here. So again, it's an unfortunate thing, but I've had to work with lots of clients who were working at a level up here overseas and when they've come to Australia to get their foot in the door, they just cannot get through at that level. They've had to take a few steps down in their career and into the industry down at this level simply to get the local experience. And once they've done that for six months, for a year, then they can start to work their way back up again. But that hardest thing is to get that first opportunity if you don't have local experience. Yeah, thanks for sharing these insights to help us condition our mindset. I do have a doubt um, that may be relevant to any entry-level professionals or entry-level job seekers, which is that, yes, as you say, it's quite important that we understand our drives and we condition it so that we know what to expect, um, which might not be necessarily a very long-lasting um, commitment without even knowing if this is the right fit for us and for our long-term career aspirations. But should this aspect actually manifest themselves during the interview when we articulate what motivates us to this job? Sure. And that, that sounds like a little bit of a rhetorical question because I think, yeah. uh, I suspect you know the answer. And obviously we have to be very strategic and careful about what we're saying. The way that you need to approach every role and sell yourself to every role, ideally as if this is your one perfect role that you're applying for. And uh, when you talk to a recruiter, you're saying things like, you know, I, I'm a, um, this is my uh, you know, the, the, um, priority role. This is the role that I'm most keen to get. Uh, because what they're looking for, of course, is return on their investment. If they offer a job to someone and go through the trouble of training them up, uh, they want someone who's going to be around the company for a long time to make that worthwhile. I've heard employers say, they don't really get value from their investment in someone for probably 12 months. That's a long time for them to be thinking, okay, I'm gonna take that person to the company and it's gonna take them many months to get used to our systems, to get you know, our processes, to get familiar with the people they're working with, to get, build a good rapport with our clients or customers. And so that we really start to see that they're adding value to the company. So clearly, they want someone who's around for the long term. That doesn't mean you're necessarily going to have the same idea uh, because at the end of the day, you must look after your own career, but you need to convince them as much as possible that you are there for the long haul 
you'd love to see that progression through the company um, to, to be around for long enough that it's worth investing in you. You're going to be there to add value to the company. It's quite important that we as candidates in our formative stage of career do some due diligence as we contemplate our career trajectory and accordingly find the aligned opportunities. That will save us time so that we don't get too wired into a commitment for year long or decade long just to realize that this is not our thing. So I guess part of the responsibility do fall on the candidates themselves to make sure we don't waste each other's time. And I guess that will certainly also help to help to make their sort of a great alignment between um, what you think and what you present. So there's a great alignment inside out and also outside in the other way. And you also touched on perks or new remuneration as a no-no as part of the question to ask. Uh, isn't this an opportunity for us to negotiate? Sure. All right. So the best way to negotiate, as they say, is always from a position of strength. And as a candidate applying for a role, you don't have a lot of strength, of course. It, it, the company sits with the power. They are deciding who's going to get the role. And you are the, one of the hopefuls who's hoping to be um, uh, asked or invited into this role. So until they've done that, you, I would stay away from salary negotiations as much as possible. They may ask you in a phone call, you know, what are your salary expectations? The best answer to that is to really, uh, first of all, do your market research and find out what is the general uh, range and then just talk about a range. I can see look, people, uh, you know, clients or, you know, I can see other companies uh, advertising similar roles for a range between, say, 70 and 80,000. Uh, so my expectations are around there, but I'm, I'm happy to be flexible. Right? So be a bit vague. Talk about a range when you in those early negotiations with a recruiter. I wouldn't talk about it in an interview because your only position of strength is when they have come back to you after the interview and said, Daisy, we're really happy with your interview. We think you're the right person for the job. Uh, we would like to uh, pr progress with offering you the role. And then they start talking about, okay, so we need to sort of now to have a discussion with you around salary. They've played their card that they, are, they want you for the role. That's when you have any pot potential to maybe try to negotiate a better salary than what they're going to offer. And again, that'll be very much based on your understanding of what's standard in the industry, uh, and especially for someone with your skills and experience. If you're someone who's got a lot of experience already, has worked on some major projects, uh, major construction projects, um, you are in a position to negotiate a higher salary. I had one client who uh, is a mechanical engineer who had done a huge, um, it was a whole, actually almost like a small um, city that he had helped uh, design in India. And he had used this particular software for that whole planning process. It was a major, major project. And he got a role with uh, Melbourne airports here. And that was largely on the basis of the fact that he'd done a very similar size project to what they were looking at. And he'd used the same software that they were using. Not very many people had used that particular software. So he became a very hot property for them. And when he start, when they talked to him about giving him the job, he was actually able to negotiate a good salary simply because he knew his value to the company. He had looked around. He knew that he was uh, someone who offered very unique uh, things to them in, in based on his experience. If you don't have that experience, if you're, again, if you're more of a graduate, if you don't have much local experience, it's much harder for you to be in a position where you can try to negotiate up. I would, for, if you're in that situation, I would strongly be just saying, I, you don't want to risk losing this opportunity based on the fact that you're going to try to ask for another $10,000 on the job. What if they just turn around and say, okay, well, thank you, we'll be in touch. And then they go and offer, give it to someone else who is prepared to take $5,000. The hardest thing for you to do when you start out in Australia is just get your first job. So from that perspective, I would be prepared to take any salary because what you're getting out of that 
more than anything else is the experience. And that experience is what you're going to build on when you apply for your next job and your next job and oh, your career builds up. The hardest thing, as I said before, is just to get that start. Um, I guess another discussion point that could potentially form another dimension of the things to negotiate will be the commitments that will more pertain to the case of international students who are currently on a student visa who obviously don't have full working right, full time working right during the university teaching period. And it's just, it just appears to be more and more common that we want to get our feet into the door in the form of an internship or cadetship during the coursework in our, say, penultimate year, not, not, not necessarily even the last year. So in that case, how can we negotiate for the reduced days of commitments throughout the week? And how do we thereafter don't compromise our competency in fulfilling the roles and responsibilities? Right, so hopefully your availability for the role your um, your level of your commitment that you're able to offer is something that is discussed earlier than the face-to-face -face interview. That's usually one of the questions that will come up um, in the recruiter phone call, you know, like in, along the lines of, you know, when can you start and so on. I and mean, if you are not in a position to fulfill a full-time role, then I would hope that you're not actually applying for those roles because it's just going to lead to disappointment for a whole lot of people mm. along the way. So I would want to be wanting to make those sorts of limitations on your availability uh, clear to the recruiter earlier in the process. You know, it's, if that's got through to the stage of a face-to-face -face interview and they're discovering a major drawback, it probably means the process hasn't worked properly. Yeah, I see. Thanks for sharing. Um, to sum up, do you mind just sharing some essential points as part of the etiquette at the end of the interview and post-interview to make sure we can competently convert the opportunity and play the long-term game? Yeah. All right. So hopefully you've, just to go look back at the whole process, hopefully you have done lots of preparation for the interview about the role, about the company. You've gone in and presented very well. You've established a good rapport with the interviewers by having lots of eye contact, uh, using their name during the interview and at the end of the interview when you say goodbye, you have presented well so that they feel that very positively towards you. From that point, you are going to send a follow-up email as soon as you can, maybe the same afternoon when you get back home or the next day if that's necessary, just a short, professional email where you say something along these lines. You say, thank you very much for interviewing me for the role of the estimator with your company. Uh, it was great to meet you. As we discussed, I feel I have a strong relevant experience, particularly when it comes to my skills in uh, using, oh, you know, in scheduling projects, in procurement, in handling variations, etc. So you, you mention again a few of the top skills they're looking for just to emphasize those. You say, um, please contact me if you have any further questions. I look forward to hearing from you and then sign off. It has to be fairly short, to the point and professional and you send it off as soon as you can to each of the interviewers. And then you sit back and wait a bit. If they've given you a time frame like we discussed earlier with uh, the, the phone calls, um, then you should wait for that time period to expire or to be up before you follow up with them again. But if they've said, oh, we'll be letting people, we'll be contacting all the applicants by letting you know by Wednesday, and Wednesday comes around and Wednesday afternoon you haven't heard, then it is absolutely appropriate that you follow up with a phone call or an email to find out what's happened with that role, to show your continuing enthusiasm and interest in the role. Yeah, awesome. Thanks very much, Landon. And that brings us to the end of our interview masterclass as the first batch of our career development episode series. Absolutely a big thanks to Landon and lead on Nara as well, your fellow colleague. You've been quite valuable assets in this podcast and we look forward to continuing um, collaborating with you in any capacity in the near future. Thanks very much again, Landon. And I hope that Thanks, Daisy. listening will be able to take the ideas on board and 
um, integrate them to benefiting and boosting you in the hiring process. And we do look forward to um, meeting you again in the next Novus Victoria episodes. See you again. Bye.